Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones that I have koinia Christ with and the unity that we have together in Him. This is the best day of my week to come gather with you to worship. I wanted to kind of give you a lay of the land here at Southside for the next month. I leave on vacation after the service. Uh, the next month, the elders are going to be preaching through Malachi, so each one has been signed a chapter. There's four chapters in that book, so we will be studying through uh, Malachi. But before I leave, I get the privilege to preach on Romans 12.1, and I've been laboring for three years, and it just felt like sin to leave before I preached the therefore. So um, the missions conference was such a huge blessing to my own soul. Thank you for all uh, who worked on that to bring that together. It just stirred my heart in so many ways. Uh, one of the ways was I was just thinking through this mission board and all that they've done. It's got so many different gifts and people that are helping to, to get missions and planting churches all over the world. And it's, it's moving in such a good direction. And so as I was looking at preaching in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, to, to really the, the focus of maybe a church planting board uh, in Jerusalem and Judea uh, and Samaria. So the, around uh, the city and, and around America. And so to, to really focus on this and have prayer groups and really an elder to, to keep this moving uh, in that area as well. And so just want all of you, as I'm going on, we're going to flush this out a lot. I just wanted to give you a bird's eye as I, as I left, but praying and thinking about church planting, how I tie into that, reproducing in all areas of the church. Is, it's just a, an atmosphere and a thought here at Southside Bible Church. God, by His grace, is bringing many pieces together, and I'll share more when I get back. Um, I just pray that as we lay a trellis for that, the organic part of what God is doing would just spring up. So we will give you much more information as we journey, but my heart is so full for that. Secondly, I've had some of you say, how does that affect me day to day? And I, I was just so blessed. I heard of a, a lady who, they, they, she has six different nations as neighbors. And now every Friday, they're inviting a different nation into their house to love and share the gospel. And so how does this affect me day to day? We heard much on prayer that all of us are praying for these places and the gospel to go forth, but really also our, our own evangelism. And, and so us entering into our day-to-day -day lives with the gospel. And so what I'm starting up, right now we're doing seven weeks on the seven sayings of Jesus Christ. And when that's over, we begin our next uh, Sunday school class. <clears throat> I'm going to be doing one it's, it's called, it's uh, God's Call uh, to Missions. And I have uh, some dear friends who put this together and they've, they've been discipling me and Laura through it and the Chandlers and the Collins have gone through it. And what it is, is it, it's gonna be us gathering and, and studying different scriptures, uh, 10, how, how do you know the Bible's the word of God? 10 arguments for that. How do you understand the Muslim faith, the Catholic faith? Uh, it, it's just loaded with coming together saying, let, let's talk about who are you sharing with and we'll all be praying for them and, and, and then learning to share your testimony in three minutes with words that everybody can understand. And so it's, it's locking shields together to say, how do I share this gospel more effective, more trained? And so anyone who wants to be a part of that, uh, we're going to give you much more information here in a few weeks. But I just wanted you to be thinking and praying about that class. And if you have... Uh, just a heart that you've, you've, you are gifted in evangelism. I need teachers because it'll be, we'll break up into groups and I need some people to help oversee. So if you have a heart for that, if you would reach out to me, that would be excellent. Okay? That's your introduction for this morning. Church planning evangelism. Smile. Some of you look like you want to eat me. Like this, it's the best news in the world to take this gospel to all and everyone. All righty. Today, we begin a new chapter in Romans. I, I love new chapters, and I hate leaving old chapters because I fall in love with them, and we feel like friends. But today, we go to Romans 12, if you'll turn to it. Romans chapter 12, with a major transition 
in our study in Romans, and someone bought me a shirt that said therefore on it, and I, I couldn't find it. I was going to wear it this morning, but it, so you don't get it. You just get a blue and white striped one, and sorry. So major transition in Romans. We spent three years, Romans 1, 1 to 11, 36, that ended for from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Amen. And so we have been studying, and we have seen the doctrine of the gospel. And then we looked at the doxology where you sing praises to God and worship him for such a gospel. And now we're going to turn to what's called duty, your responsibility. So we've seen axioms, truths, and we've seen adoration. And now we will look at action. We're going to begin to look at the practical response to how then shall we live in light of such a gospel. And this question is one of the biggest reasons I chose Romans to preach through at this time. When I survey the wondrous cross, and, and when I survey Southside Bible Church and meet with it and counsel and do life with it and observe and listen, I realize that, that many understand the doctrine of Romans very well. You, you, you really get them. You've been equipped in those truths, and it's beautiful. But there's just less, less or fewer who understand the key components of how they all tie together, how they work. How, how do I live day to day my Christian life? How I, I live a life that's well-pleasing to God. And so the, the whole book of Romans is bookended with the obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. How do I get there? In the proper connections of the body of truth that Paul is teaching is probably the most important part of Romans. And so I see these, these disconnections hurt you and, and how to help you make the right connections so that you might offer up your body a living sacrifice that's pleasing to God. That's my heart. That's my desire. And Paul is going to be leading us into these actions now as a church. But he has worked hard on how children of God think and worship their God. And now he's going to show how are these all tied together. And if you don't tie them together rightly, it will make shipwreck of your faith and it will steal the joy that I'm a minister for and want in your life. I'm on a mission for your joy and good. And how that is tied to the glory of God, they're married. And so I want the obedience of faith to be a pleasing aroma to your God, our God. And that is where we find ourselves then this morning. So let me read our passage, and we will go to our God and ask his blessing. <clears throat> Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This morning, I want to show you five considerations to guide us well and our response to God for his great salvation. We're going to see the connection. It's therefore. We're going to look at a compelling nature as I urge you. We're going to look at Paul's compassion. Brethren, the controlling drive of your life is the mercies of God. And then the charge to us, new worship under the new covenant, is to offer up your bodies a holy and living sacrifice to God. And that's... That's our goal this morning, so let's go to our God and pray. Father, I come before you and I pray now as we open up this verse that your spirit would illuminate it to the minds and the hearts here this morning. God, I pray that you would do mighty things in our midst, but what I have been asking and still ask is that everyone in this room would be a worshiper of the living God and that everyone in this room has made the good offering the offering of their life to God. Lord, I pray any who have not done that this morning that you would work in their hearts and you would produce that. And any who may have crawled off the altar this morning, or that they would lay it all down before your very presence. And so meet us and do what only you can do now in our midst, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 12.1 the connection. Therefore, we have been trained at Southside to say, what is it there for? I don't even have to say it. This is the word that holds the whole book of Romans 
together. I know I'm weird that I like these little things, but therefore is so important. I think it's all of Christianity. It's really what keeps this from Romans 1 through 11 being academic. I've just learned these things. Thank you. I'm going to give the rest of my life to just keep learning these things. I like learning these things. It's, it's fun. I, I can uh, win Bible trivia quizzes in our family house. All these things. It's beautiful. And on the other side, it's what keeps you from ending in moralism. I just live the Judeo-Christian ethics. I try to do the best I can in my life. And these fill our churches, both those airs. They're everywhere. It's what makes Christianity Christianity this morning then is this therefore. There's no other religion that has a therefore. Did you know that? None of them have a therefore. If you don't get the therefore, if your life doesn't have a therefore, if your understanding of historical Christianity doesn't bring a therefore, you will make shipwreck of your life. And I want everyone in this room to walk out with a therefore. I want to show you a pitfall that I, I want you to avoid in the next year as we study Romans 12 through 16. And that's this. Okay, let's go learn what God requires of us. I, I will go live it. Here you go, God. Here, here's my spiritual act of worship. And you're just going to go get after it. And, and you're so in love with God. You're changing by these truths. You're different than you were before. Hallelujah. And then it happens. You get deeper and deeper into this word. And you start to realize, wait a minute, I crawl off the altar. I, 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 I had such good intentions when I got saved. And I just started giving God everything. And now I'm starting to find things in my life that don't want to submit to God. And they're, they're stuck. And I'm struggling. The world has more of an impact on me than I thought it ever could. When I was first saved, man, the world was never going to be an impact on me. I'm not serving the body the way that he's calling me to. I like my own plans over a brother or sister who are hurting. When God says, let love be without hypocrisy, I'm finding more hypocrisy. It sets in. And you say, wait a minute, I, I have remaining sin from Romans 7 that we studied. And I'm not doing as well at this as I had hoped. And so my only options, I'll be a hypocrite. And I'll come to church every Sunday, and I will never let the body of Christ know the real me. Because everybody else is killing it, and I'm not. And I'm just, I'm going to cover it up. No one's going to know the way I'm failing. Or the enemy comes and he says, look at your righteousness. Look at your righteousness. It, it's so weak and flimsy. I wonder if you're really a Christian. And you sit there week in and week out. And my pastor keeps saying, rest in Christ. But I can't. Does he see my life? So I'm going to go work harder. I'm, I'm just going to work at it harder to, and get more righteousness. And the more I keep trying, it's, it's getting worse. And you sit here this morning in despair. Paul says to go preach the gospel to the lost. And truth be told, it's hard to invite people to come be as miserable as I am in this gospel. And the problem is you don't get the therefore. You don't get the therefore. That Christ died for your sins. And you forgot the other half of the gospel that he also imputes his righteousness to your account. So now you sit before God justified by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not by your own actions. Therefore, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. You can't forget the therefore as you start the journey. I can't tell you how important this is. I see it on a daily basis. You forget the therefore. And you start out loved and accepted and justified and you're so excited. Don't miss this. <laughs> Last week we sat, on, two weeks ago, we sat on the mountaintop of Romans 11, 33 through 36 and we worshiped and we praised God from whom all blessings flow. And as you look out, it's so great a salvation. 11 chapters, I offer up my body to God, a living and holy sacrifice. Not Now I'm going to, Go live the best life I can for God. 
Enough with Romans 1 through 11. I, I know the cross. I know Jesus. I know the gospel. Let's move on. Let's, let's go do it. Let's go live it. And I'm telling you, your aroma will become a stench in God's nostrils. Every day of your life is a therefore. And you must get up every day and, and live into the therefore. I get up every morning and say, therefore, by the mercies of God, I offer up my body a living sacrifice. Every day I have to preach the therefore as I begin. What is it there for? To never forget the mercies of God. And so I'm going to ask you as direct as I know how to because I love you. Does your life have a therefore? Are you trying to live Romans 12 through 16 <clears throat> so that you can have a therefore? Are you trying to change your life so much so that then you know you're accepted by God? And I want you to think about this question and not just skim over it. Has Jesus just been a makeover in your life? He's made your life a little better as you live, mainly for you. Or has he taken a total takeover that we're going to look at this morning? He's calling for your life. I had to sit in my office and wrestle and repent and cry out to God. Is this therefore the controlling word in my life? Is that what controls my life? Too many times it's now, go live for God. And it dries up and it withers and it becomes cold and distant and you get more failures than victories because you don't have a therefore. And then the other is this, I just live in grace. I get Romans 1 through 11, I'm saved. There's, there, there's no therefore that grace will begin to change and transform your life. It will, it will give you a Romans 12 through 16. So don't just live into Romans 1 through 11, the gospel, and think that's where it ends. My life, I just study doctrine. It's my hobby. It's my love. Therefore, grace is that you're going to love God and love others. That's what this therefore does. That's what grace does in a heart. So again, do you have a therefore this morning? I grew up in the Catholic Church, and there was no therefore. Your works are a part of what justifies you before God, and I was trying every day, kind of, to get justified and right before God. And I pray that none of you are stuck there this morning, and that you have a therefore, and you believe this gospel, and you are righteous before God and accepted and loved. You can't go to Romans 12 through 16 till you have a therefore. And the church is full of people trying to do 12 through 16 without a therefore. And you know what's happening? It's failing. It doesn't work. And if you just sit there honest before God, you'd say it's not working. Therefore is the word that joins justification and sanctification together. Getting right with God and then being made holy the way they marry is with this word, therefore. It's the most important word you're going to come across. And so I've had to live with a lot of accusations the last three years. All you preach is grace. <laughs> you just preach grace. And as we've journeyed line by line and precept upon precept to get to this morning, therefore, I preach a grace that gives you a therefore so you can live Romans 12 through 16. Grace empowers Christian living. You've got to have a therefore. And now the rest of you are going to be saying for the next year, he just is a legalist. <laughs> he, all he talks about is holy living every week. I just want the gospel. Give me Jesus. And, and the, the therefore demands a passionate and determined and consistent pursuit of holiness. You can't look at Romans 1 through 11 and not say, I want to be like Jesus Christ. I give myself to him. And you're going to be crying. I, I want more justification. And so I'm just, that's all for free. That's my problems. Okay. I brought you into my world. And one more thing for free. I got to hurry. Parents, parents, do you know how to train your kids to have a therefore? 
And if you don't understand that, seek me out. Seek other elders out. You got to know what a therefore is in the training of your kids or you'll just moralize them. And so the true parenting gets a therefore. And so I just pray that we're all laboring together to get that with these little ones and the gifts that God has given to us. So there's your connection. I could go on. I was going to do the whole sermon on therefore, but I've done it too many times. And I can see in your faces I need to move on. So connection, therefore, compelling. I urge you. This is a strong word. It's a command. It's a strong exhortation. It's a soul that's pleading. And I'm joining the Apostle Paul this morning, looking out at a church that I love with all of my heart, saying, I urge you. I urge you. Brothers and sisters, as I look at this damning culture that Paul's going to say in the next verse, don't be conformed to it. As I look at the cold American church, we've been rocked to sleep during COVID. And I look at you with so much love and just say, I urge you, respond to the grace of God this morning. Offer up your bodies to him, a living sacrifice. There just are not enough words in the English vocabulary for this. I'm begging and I'm urging you this morning. Little little lambs, our little kids in this church, I'm urging you to give your lives to God. And teenagers who are being tested like never before, you you, you got the, the thoughts of this culture that are so broken. You got pressure with people now recanting their faith on social media on a constant basis. I I hear all this stuff. They're they're teaching you that to hold to the truths of the Word of God is old school, fuddy-duddy, and and really a cult. And I've seen several buy into this that now hate Jesus. And so teenagers, I urge you, I urge you, Give your lives to God and follow this word. Singles, I urge you, with all the relational and sexual pressures being thrown at you like never before, I urge you to come out from this culture and offer up your bodies to God. Young marrieds and families, temptation to pull away from the body of Christ, All you need is each other and your family. I urge you to plug into the body of Christ, even if it messes up naps. Those of you in midlife crisis and you're journeying and you're like, I I thought all these things would happen. I did what God said and my family's a mess and they won't talk to me. I just want to go after the world and be happy till I die. I urge you, midlifers, Offer up your lives to God. Seniors, tempted to give up pouring into the next generation, just sit around and talk about how bad they are, watch Fox News all day. There's a temptation to grow in bitterness. And I urge you, seniors, give yourselves to the young people in this church. Pastors, who went through COVID and are beat up and spit out and trials within and fears without and you're, you're just weary. I urge you by the mercies of God to shepherd the flock of God into this reality. I urge you, I hope you feel that. I just urge you, respond to the grace of God. Connection, therefore, compelling, I'm urging you, the compassion, Brethren, Paul's love for his fellow brethren, he's tender, he's loving. It's to us, children of God. This is to you. It's our exhortation. It's our blessing. But do note one thing in particular here. This sweet word tells me something really important. Believers need to be exhorted to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. It shows me that because it's a living sacrifice, what can happen? It can crawl off the altar. It could crawl back off. We drift. We get distracted with life and trials and 
busyness and sin. That's our battle this morning. We need urging. We, we need brethren loved by God. Offer up your bodies. And so the question is, have you crawled off since at the cross, at the cross, when I first saw the light and the burden of my sins rolled away, have you crawled off the altar? As you sit here this morning, are you on the altar saying, here's my heart, Lord, take what is yours? Do you need to repent this morning and get back on the altar? I urge you. I urge you. And I need a controlling drive because that force of the world is strong. And God has given us a stronger drive than this compelling world. And the fourth point of the controlling drive is I urge you by the mercies of God. This is one of the most life-changing truths in my life. And so I, I pray that you get this this morning. This is what makes Christianity truly unique to every religion. As you study world religions, there, there's some consistent threads that run through them. You, you have a deity, you have a human, and God's upset with us. He's upset with us because of sin. And you have to do things to try to appease the angry deity. Go knock on doors, fly into Twin Towers. There's things you got to go do to appease that God. And Christianity, to some of you, it's the same. It's the same. It's sinners in the hands of an angry God is how he views believers still. He still views me that way, and I'm just trying to appease him and get that wrath off me every day by the things that I do. And I, I meet you, and you're still thinking that way. And I, I want to live my life, so I appease him. And at the end of the day, if I pressed you, do you feel the smile of God as you sit here this morning? And I'd have you raise your hand, but I don't want to do that. Martin Luther, when his friends said, Martin, what is it you want? And he, and he said, love God? I hate him because he's given a standard that I can't keep. And then he said, I want a God who I can love and loves me. And in Jesus Christ, that is answered. And now there's a God that I can love, and he loves me. But for us, brothers and sisters, as God looks to motivate us to live holy, righteous lives that are pleasing to him, he doesn't hold the sword of justice over our head. I urge you, by the justice of God, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. I urge you, by the wrath of God against sin, I urge you, put your ear to hell and listen to the screams. I urge you by the, by, by the just horrors of hell, offer up your bodies to God. But here, Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. He just holds out God's large heartedness and open handedness and grace. A friend of mine said, He reaches out with his velvet cords of sovereign mercy. Therefore, points you back to Romans 1 through 11. And it's the soul that is taken up with Romans 11, 32, for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all. And we look at his dealings and they show that God is merciful in Jesus Christ. The tender mercies of our God. They are the fuel and the sap and the empowerment to live the Christian life, to offer up your bodies to God. Can't do an end around his mercies. Who was the hardest worker for the kingdom of God? I would say Paul. He was a violent aggressor. He killed people who said they were Christians. He said, yet I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy as the greatest of sinners, the foremost of all. He never could get over the mercy of God. I think of the woman in Luke 7 washing Jesus' feet and she's worshiping him and Jesus said she was forgiven much so she will love much. In Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, there's one that takes it and buries it in the ground. And, and, and the view, why did he do that? Because of his view of the master and he said, he said to him, I know that you are a hard and exacting man. 
It's why legalists will never become a living sacrifice pleasing to God. I know you're a hard, demanding God, and I'm just trying to to appease you. Uh, They don't feel loved by God, and there's the problem. Jacob served Rachel for 14 years and said it was like a day because of my great love for her. I feel the same way this morning, don't you? These mercies just fuel my heart. I get so weary and tired and I want to stop and I want to slow down and the mercies of God begin to fuel me again and again and again. I'm a man who's been mercied by God and they are new every morning. I could preach Romans 1 through 11 all over again and never get to the end of the infinite mercies of God. You can't exhaust them. We just see them in a little mirror dimly. With each passing day, I'm seeing them clear. And, and those are the realities that I walk up to the altar and I lay down my life and I say, I'm, I'm no longer mine. I'm yours, God. And I'm, I'm ready to use these members for your service till I die. Your glory is my chief end. That's what the gospel does. And that's why Paul fought and labored for 11 chapters so that you would sit and marvel and believe this gospel that God is merciful to shut up sinners who look to Christ alone and find abundant, ever-flowing mercy and and that they receive every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And the Spirit is given to you to show and remind you how great they are on a daily basis from the Word of God from creation and from providence so that your heart would be informed and inflamed to do what Paul is going to say next. So come with me to this holy ground. The connection is therefore, the compelling is I urge you, the compassion is brethren, the controlling drive of your life is the mercies of God. And the charge now is to offer up your bodies to God, a living and holy sacrifice. Here's the essence and summary of the Christian life. Your mind needs to understand doctrine. You need to labor in the Word of God, and you need to go deep, and you need to understand all the beauties of this gospel. And you need to believe them, and you need to entrust your life to them. And those truths should fill your heart as you look at the mercies of God. And your heart should be taken up with a God like this, And then here's my will. It's yours, God. And so we're always looking for the mind, affections, and will, and that's where Paul's going. Last two weeks ago, I only exist for God. That's all I do. My world and life view, I don't exist for me anymore. I've been awakened. I understand the folly of living for self-glory. Now I live for his glory. I exist wholly, fully, and solely for God. I've been bought with a great price, therefore honor God with your body. There's our call. The statement is so full and sweet. It's interesting how Paul puts it. He, he pulls out a word here, and it, it, it's a concept out of the Old Testament sacrificial system. And that was how they worshiped God in the Old Testament for thousands of years. They would come and they would offer up an animal unblemished <coughs> for a sacrifice. And now we come to the new covenant, and this is major what's being said here. Some crucial changes in the new covenant. Like the veil has been torn in two to the Holy of Holies, and you get to come right into the presence of God with blameless, with great joy. And now by the mercies of God, I come into your presence, and Paul jumps on this. He says, come in now, and and there's a new kind of worship. And I want you to present, that word is used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint, the translation of, of the Old Testament in the Greek. And it's the, the laying of the sacrificial animal on the altar. And you would come in and you would bring that animal and it would be a sacrifice and the priest would kill it and its carcass would be burned and the blood would be sprinkled. That was your offering for your sin. And Jesus comes on the scene and John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus doesn't bring an offering to God. He was the offering. Jesus was the burnt offering and he was consumed on Calvary's tree in our place to make atonement for sin. 
And that's Romans 1 through 11. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your offering. And now you come before God, loved and accepted because of that offering. But you bring a sacrifice. And you come, the presence of God, and you put it on the altar, and you lay it down. And it's God, and it's not an animal. It's you. That's the spiritual worship in the New Testament. This is my offering to the one who gave his only begotten son on my behalf so that I could have my sins forgiven and be given eternal life. Here's my offering. Me. That's big. Your life and it's not parts of your life. It's not here's my leg. Here's my eye. I just too many of us give God parts. And Jesus gave everything. You can have my finances, God, but not my lustful passions. You can have my study of the word, but not my submission to my husband. You can have my service, but not my pride and my self-exaltation. You can have my pride, but not my service. That's how God approves me, <laughs> my service. Can't have that. How many just want to give parts of ourselves? Jesus gave himself, all of himself, to accomplish redemption. And I call you this morning to look at the cross again at a dead, bloated corpse, hanging dead in your place, he gave up all for us. And now he calls us to give up all to him. This morning, the call is to hold nothing back in our new worship. You just heard a testimony of giving your very life with cancer to God. What is it this morning that you will not give to him? What is it that you just don't want to surrender do you know what is stealing your fullness of joy? That thing that you won't surrender. It's a thief. God wants our whole life. No animal. He wants our life. How many of you won't give it all? Did Jesus give it? He gave it all. So no partial. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You've got to surrender all. We love to sing the hymn, but it, you're supposed to mean it. Are you holding back a secret, treasured sin before God this morning? The happiest and most blessed are those who give all. When God puts the finger on the heart and says, I want this too, and I fight and I, I wrestle, I'm the most miserable. And when I surrender, whatever it is, joy flows like a river, like we heard last week of a, of a husband martyred. So I want to ask you, by the mercies of God, to spend some time this afternoon. I believe what we're talking about is more important than football. And I want you to ask God, what am I withholding from truly giving to you? Maybe you've known it for some time, and I just want you this morning to look at the cross and give it all to him. Jim Elliot said, A man is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer up your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. We will finish that verse up when I come back. We haven't even begun to open it up. So I couldn't leave till I said this. So there it is. The application is we can crawl off. And that's why Paul is exhorting us this morning. It's a battle. It's a fight of faith, the Christian life. And maybe you're just so busy at work and family needs are looming and surviving, and it's just taken over your heart. Maybe you're in a really hard trial, and Lord, this is too much, and you've been growing bitter and despondent. 
Maybe the pressure of living in Colorado with all the bills, they're just squeezing. And all I can think about is you've crawled off looking to self to take care of your needs instead of the mercies of God who promises to care for those needs. Maybe it's apparent you're weary. You've drifted into bonbons in the Disney Channel, romance novels and sleep, and you've just crawled off the altar. Maybe it's with training your kids. We gave them to God at birth and you've taken them back and you become a helicopter parent and you're just living in this tension instead of freedom. Maybe you're single and you said, I want to serve God wholeheartedly and you've grown discontent and you're, you're moving into areas you shouldn't and you're grumpy at people who, who are married. And maybe you've crawled off the altar this morning of that high, high calling of singleness. And maybe as we began the new year when I preached about being a, a member of a church and its privilege, and you've drifted from God's sweet design of the body of Christ, of us locking shields together and using our gifts to grow each other up. The bottom line is you want your life. You like God in it, but you don't want him to take all of it. And what I see in this passage is our new covenant worship is I, I give all. All of my members are now here. God, they're yours to serve you. I used to serve the devil. I was his errand boy. And now by the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want to use these members to serve the king of kings and people. That's our calling. Stare again at his mercies and the desire will grow back and it will consume you. But go back to his mercies and they just, you'll just be like this wilted flower and you'll be like, it's, it's amazing how deep the mercies of God are. And as we close, I just want to talk real straight with you. You need to get this right before Jesus comes back or you die. Do you have a therefore? Do you believe what God has done in Jesus Christ, that he came and died for your sins on a cross and he lived the life that you should have and that God required? And that by believing in what Jesus did, not by your works, you can be made right with God. Have you entrusted yourself to that? You can't just be academic. Have you given yourself to that truth? Has it brought doxology into your life where you are a worshiper of God? Or did it just stay cold doctrine? Has it brought a joyful offering of your life to God? And your greatest burden is the sin that keeps you from, from doing that the way you desire. Are you a pursuer of holiness this morning? And if not, you need salvation. And Jesus offers himself to any sinners in that place. Come to me if you're weary and heavy laden with doing all this on your own and I will give you rest for your souls. So he bids you, come. Come to that sweet Savior and find eternal life. I'm gonna be quiet. Let's pray. Father, this is so good. And I thank you for therefore. I thank you that we are the only, the only people that have one. You have done it all in Christ. Through him, we are loved and accepted. Through him, we have every spiritual blessing and we have power to go live, Romans 12 through 16, to go love and have mercy to others. God, I pray that you will produce that in every heart. Let no one walk out of here without a therefore. If any have drifted from it and have been looking to their own hands and feet to find your acceptance, Lord, let them find time of refreshing in the presence of Jesus Christ this morning. And so, Father, I pray now as a church that we will pour out our hearts to you in worship. Let, let all sing this praise to you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.